to exploit and abuse another woman. That's, I want to read you just an introduction from an otherwise very long and scholarly paper. This is by us. I was 14 when I first heard of the concept. This is the concept of what your hands possess. I remember the scene vividly. There were about six of us seated around a rustic bench and table at Muslim youth camp. I was the youngest of the group. Having ambiti ambitiously joined several college women leisurely discussing interesting and controversial topics with one of the camp teachers during free time, someone mentioned, someone mentioned the word concubine. And I remember wondering what it meant. As the, as the conversation progressed, someone else mentioned that it is said that the prophet himself had one. At this, tears began to form in the eyes of one of the young women, one I particularly liked and respected. And she earnestly asked the teacher if it was true. She received a reluctant but affirmative nod. Yes, some believe this to be true. This seemed too much for her, and she abruptly left the table for her cabin where she cried for some time. We all knew her tears were sincere and heartfelt an honest response to a shocking revelation. Throughout this disturbing scene, my curiosity grew more and more intense. What is a concubine? I finally asked my mother, seated next to me, who had joined the discussion shortly after I had. My question had to be repeated several times. However, as my, as, as my mother busily tried to counter the, the direction of the discussion, isn't it true that there is a dispute on that point? And didn't he eventually marry her anyway? Finally, she turned to me and explained rather simply, it means a female slave honey. Honey it means a female slave. Later that day, I learned that a concubine is not just a female slave, but a female slave who must allow her master to have sexual relations with her. That was what so disturbed the young lady at the table. And if I paraphrase, paraphrase and that is, what so disturbs me ever since that day. And then it goes on to make a scholarly presentation of what does Ramalikat Imanukum mean. Who finds this is reflecting something in them? Do you find any reflection of yourself in this? Who? Men as well. Maybe you're not as bad as everyone thinks. <laughs> okay. Well, if... Um, to put it this way, if you're not bothered by it, you either have thought about it so long and resolved it in one fashion or another. Or, you have such a mindset to be incapable of thinking about it. And as tonight, and tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, my job, and that's why I ask you go around, and, and, and I'm, I'm, my job is always to juggle brains and get them to think about issues. Uh, I rarely resolve anything, and I rarely provide solutions. That doesn't mean that I don't have solutions, but my solutions are my own business. Um, you have your own autonomy. With that said, I'll leave this line of argument for tomorrow. Because I want to pick it up again, and it's going to be picked up again and again until I leave, inshallah. And let's ask an interesting question. <coughs> Was that was these problems an issue of discourse in Islamic an issue of discourse in Islamic civilization? And by the way, I keep looking at the women because I'm sort of intentionally ignoring the men tonight. <laughs> was it an issue of discourse in the Islamic civilization? <coughs> the position of women, how women are to be treated. What is their function? Yeah. Considering that there's 50% of the population, it should have been. Can you cite an example? 
An example of the discourse? Or the example of the discourse. Well, in, in, in the book, um, The Bale Family, by Southern Okay. And that would point to me that at least one of the wives of the proper symbolism was was constantly thinking, or that the wives in general were thinking, and therefore the women must have been thinking, or should have been thinking, or were thinking, that how are we to be treated if if there there are to be no Muslim slaves? How okay. Are women to be treated? Another example for Osama, I believe she asked the Prophet why it seems that the Qur'an is um, directed towards men and not women, and as a result of that, I believe the ayah was revealed. So it's in Yeah. So, just question. Okay, and we can... Was there not argue, also arguments um, after, um, after the death of the Prophet um, between Aisha and Abu Huraira on whether or not, um, on what interests a man's prayer? Whether another woman passing in front of a man interrupts his prayer. Yeah, and and what was Aisha's point about Abu Huraira? Um, I'm citing also from the bit all the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, her point about him was that he, she felt that he did not know the Prophet long enough, and he cited far too many examples for someone who knew him for such a short period of time. So in other words, she she disputed his his authority. Right. Right. Okay. Why did Aisha, and here the, the, uh, the Shiites might have, of course, a very particular point of view on this. I think I should, if I may interrupt, um, the Surah and Nisa, and, uh, uh, I, I think when uh, I read the Najul Balagha, and uh, especially the sermon to, not the sermon, the letter to Imam Ali, wrote to his son, in which he particularly uh, talks about women and how they should be treated is not very much different from what uh, Rashida pointed out in her... Uh, there is actually... The, uh, I, I completely agree with her sentiments here, and that those were the feelings that I had after reading that letter. That how can that work? Okay. How, how does this work? And in fact, those of you who haven't seen Nahj al Balagha, everyone here knows what Nahj al Balagha is? It's, it's, it's basically a compilation of the sayings and letters of Imam Ali. Those of you who have, haven't taken a look at it, take a look at it and especially read this part in which he addresses issues of women because it is quite interesting. But on the other side, why did Aisha, Mustalha, and Zubair rebel? What did they want? Justice for the people who killed the Prophet. Maawiyah wanted that. Perhaps did they simply just want power to make their ideas become the ones that govern the new Islamic society? And even perhaps, who is the leader of the group? Talha, Zubair, or Aisha? Aisha was. Aisha. 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 two men because a woman simply couldn't take the reins of power at that time. So by forming the alliance with the How do you know that? What? How do you know that? That a woman can take the reins? Because she was the one who decided that where they would go, which families they would see, try to form alliances, Tal and Zubair had their input also, but... If she was a he, it would be the same thing. Okay, when the Khawarij rebelled, shortly after, who's leading them? Men. Who's leading the rebellion? It was a woman. It was a woman. She's the one that went and she, she went to Baghdad? She's the one that eventually ended up in Baghdad, yeah. And she conquered, she conquered a, uh, a city and she led the prayer. And she and she read the entire Surat Baqarah and Surat Nisa. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, go ahead. And do, do, I, I wasn't going to give the full story, but yeah. So that's, that's basically true. She led the Khawarij and in fact went and conquered the territory and led prayer. 
in that territory. Who's this? I can't remember her name now because I knew someone was going to ask me her name. <laughs> but the best way to find her is just look at any book of history, the Khawarij shortly after Imam Ali, and she she's there. I mean, both in English and Arabic, there's a lot about her. Jad, you remember her name? Yeah. Now, and in fact, I bring up this point because Imtiaz's point is, I don't think it's correct. Talha and Zubair supported Aisha, but they supported Aisha's bid for power. And it was Aisha that wanted and thought that she is entitled to it. Now, but the perception we have and of course, re remember here, I mean, you are free agents, uh, you're not children, so you, you are free to accept or reject what I say or, or dump it in the garbage can when you leave or whatever. That's your right. Um, but there, I've, I've gotten used to, when I speak to Muslims, to a whole bunch of frenzy accompanying everything. And um, the best way to deal with the frenzy is just uh, I ignore it. But the perception is, and even by people like Fatma Miranisi, is that there was some type of feminist discourse in the early period, and then suddenly we have a whole period of non-discourse where there is nothing going on in the field. There is no discussion of, no controversy over this. Now, I had two options when I was invited here. Originally, I was sending to get certain manuscripts from Egypt and Damascus that related to this, but um, for many different circumstances, the, the project f did fell through. So I chose another text to give you an example of what this course did exist. This, by, this is by a man, and his name is al Jahad. Anyone here of al Jahad before? He was a poet, a philosopher, a literary figure. And Jahiz is writing around the 5th century Hijra, so about the 11th century. And he is debating among his peers. Hmm? Yeah. He died in the 4th century. No, he died in the 300 something, the 4th century. So in 10th, 10th, yeah? He died in 343. I think it's 43. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't Xerox the uh, death date. It doesn't matter. He's fairly early. I mean, the point is, is that he's fairly early. Now, I'm going to read to you some things that, at least when I read, when I studied, was one of these very old sheikhs who was half, who couldn't tell the difference between a man and a woman. <laughs> uh, he was saying it was a complete, no reaction, but I was sitting there uh, churning in my seat. At the time, of course, I like, was like most men, uh, wanted to tell women their place. And I couldn't believe that this guy was sitting there telling me all this stuff. <laughs> but I wanted an ijazah from him, so I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> so this is in a book he wrote. And in, he wrote several rasail. Rasail means uh, treaties on women. And in one of these treaties, treatises, treatises yeah. Okay. I will skip over the Arabic. I don't think it's necessary. This is from his treatise called On Women. He says, We do not claim, we, he's referring to himself alone, we do not claim, nor does any rational person claim that women are superior to men or that men are superior to women. To women. They are neither a rank or two or more below them, nor are they a rank or two or more above them. 
But we have seen people that hold women in great contempt and deprive them of most of their rights. It is, it is a stark failure for man to be unable to give the rights of his father and paternal uncles without compromising the rights of his mother and his maternal uncle. For this, we have mentioned some of the attractive aspects of women or attributes. If it, if it had not been that some people take pride in strength, endurance, and lack of desire for women so much so that they consider the strength of a man's love for his mother, wife, and children indicative of weakness, we would not have gone to the trouble of compiling what we have included in this treatise. So, he is saying the following argument. Now remember when is this being written? This is not some westernized, liberal, uh, Harvard or Yale graduate or Stanford graduate who's been corrupted by the West. This is al -Jahd. This is as orthodox as you can get. We do not say, and no one in his rational mind would say that men are, are above women or that women are above men. Neither of them are a level or two or more below or above the other. But we have seen people disrespect them and deny them their rights. And it is a true shame that men cannot honor their fathers without depriving their mothers their rights. And it is so much so that we have seen people bragging about their strength by saying that we do not love women and using their lack of love to their wife or to their mother or to their children as proof of their strengths. And this is why we compiled this book. Now, what is the book that al has compiled? He basically starts by doing a systematic response to his opponents. In other words, Ajrahiz has certain people in mind that he is responding to in his discussion. And he is debating with. And in his res systematic response to his opponents, he is trying to prove certain points to them. And he breaks down his arguments by item. So he says, Point number seven. I skipped over seven of them. If, if I had, originally my plan was, because originally all of this was supposed to come out in a, in a long article, but Allah willed otherwise, uh, I was planning to translate the whole article and publish it as an appendix, but that did not, unfortunately, happen. So I've asked uh, someone called uh, Yasser, to translate passages of it, and it's unfortunate because the whole thing is worth reading. Point seven, skipping through one, skipping through one through seven, point seven. He says, in proof that the Arabs before Islam did not know the hijab, and here I should explain to you what the hijab is so uh, people won't frantically run outside and say Khalid, says, Khalid is against the hijab. Hijab means isolation. That women, that, that Arabs before Islam did not know the isolation of women. He, he says, men have always conversed with women in Jahiliya and Islam. And it was such, it was such Uh, the translation is not... Okay, we got it. Men and women did not know the hijab before Islam. And they always remained respectful. And consequently, they were always cautious not to stare at each other. However, they always gathered and conversed 
and socialized with each other. And they always celebrated together in social events. Everyone following? Okay. And consequently, a man who was addicted to the gatherings, social gatherings in which there were women, was called Izir. And this, and hence the word Ziyara. Ziyara means to visit. And um, from that was the fact that the awliya, the sheikhs, the respected ones, used to arrive with their who criticize this as long as no sin is being committed. To the extent that at, and the situation continued so after Islam to the extent that Akhi um, Busayna, uh, this is one of the Sahaba, considered it quite repulsive. And he went and complained to a husband of a woman called Jamil that his wife is always present in too many celebrations. And Jamil responded that it is none of your business. Anyway, so it goes on describing the same idea for a while. And men continued to converse with women before Islam and after Islam until the point in which the hijab, the isolation, was imposed, made mandatory upon the wives of the Prophet exclusively. <coughs> and not upon anyone else. And consequently, this is the reason Jamil wa Busayna met and married and fell in love, or met, fell in love and married. And this is why Afra wa Urwa, two Sahabiyin, met and fell in love and married. Wa Kathir wa Azza, as well, met, fell in love and married. Wa Qais wa Lubna, wa Asma wa Murqush, wa Abdullah bin Ajlan wa Hind. So all of these could not have possibly met and fell in love and married if the hijab was imposed. Now, again, I am emphasizing for this little thing here. I am reading from a jahiz, Risalat Aqiyan. Check it yourself. definition of hijab is it temporal or is this a shifting definition? The shifting definition. We'll get into the shifting definitions tomorrow. But today I uh, I'll limit it um, to. He goes on. And we all know that Imam al Hassan in his time was the best person. By the way, Zahid was a Sunni, he's not a Shiite. Al Imam al Hassan in his time was the best person alive. And if conversing with women and looking at them was forbidden and shameful, he would not have done it. Al-Munzir ibn Zubair would not have allowed it, and Abdullah ibn Zubair would not have advised it. Basically, I want to hear, I, I'm, I'm not a nice fellow, as everyone knows, and I put a lot of energy and effort in what I teach. And at the least, I can expect is to be somewhat reciprocated. So keep that in mind. If two of you show up tomorrow, I'll teach them. Uh, numbers don't matter to me. Okay. And we all know that Al Hassan in his time was the best person alive. And if conversing with women and looking at them was forbidden and shameful, he would not have done it. Because Al Hassan did. And Al Munzir ibn Zubayr, one of the Sahaba, would not have allowed it, and he did. And Abdullah ibn Zubayr would not have advised it. Advised it. Advised it. And he did. Let's look at the Arabic. 
ولم يشر به عبد الله ابن زبير قد يشر به مين The, 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 any Arabic expression, come on. Yeah, وَلَمْ يُشْرْ بِهِ أَشَارَ That comes from أَشَارَ يُشْرْ To point to? يُشْرْ from إِشَارَ So, Abdullah bin Zubayr would not have literally advised him. Okay. Then he says, and know that Al Hashawiya, who's the Hashawiya? much like uh, if you would say the Shia or the Sunnah or whatever, but they, they, they were a sect that became extinct. And he says, al hashawiya were definitely incorrect in forbidding looking at women. Now, I don't know if this is hitting you as in the same way it is impacting upon me or the way it impacted upon me when I read it the first time when I was 15 years old. At the time, I thought the Sheikh was making it up and uh, and even after I memorized it and passed the exam on it, I still thought that someone must have made it up. Because it sounded too contemporary. It just doesn't work that way. Then he says to the Hashawiyah, this hadith and the preceding, he, he quotes several hadiths, this hadith and the preceding discussion nullify what the Hashawiyah contends that both the first and subsequent, subsequent looks are forbidden. For there can be no conversation without countless looks <laughs> between men and women. And unless what they refer to as a forbidden look is to look at hair or the body and what is, his, is hidden by clothes, clothes, which may only be seen by the husband, the guardian or the clothes relative the mahram. So, what he's saying is that what they say Hajawiyah's argument that the first and the subsequent looks are haram cannot be right because there cannot be a conversation without a first and a second look. Unless what they're talking about is looking at places where you should not be looking. In other words, looking at parts of the body that are concealed by clothes. And the reason they're concealed by clothes is you're not supposed to be looking at them. It's a logical, self-evident argument. He goes on. And no, no, this is like the Arabic old style, and no, and be on, on notice, and things like that. And no, that a shabi, a shabi is a famous jurist of his time, was a scholar of the people of Iraq, and the most famous scholar in Iraq and the most knowledgeable among the scholars of Iraq. And if looking at women was forbidden, he would not have allowed it and would have not taken the liberty of looking at women in his classes. Proof, I have to always keep checking to make sure that, um, that the translation is right. Proof that looking at any woman is not forbidden is that women that that are too old for marriage can be seen by men without putting on their outer garments. It's a radical idea, but it was done in the medieval time. If it were forbidden when she was young, it would not be allowed now that she is old. Rather, it is simply a matter where the extremists have exceeded the extremists have exceeded the limits 
of recommended jealousy to the realm of bad manners <laughs> and stupidity until it became with them like a mandatory truth. Now let me say the Arabic for, how many of you know Arabic? Let, let me first find out. Define no. Yeah. Okay. Like how many of you can sort of even re recognize that, yes, this is more or less what it's saying? Vaguely. 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 Like, e well, okay, fine, yeah. I think it's very important because it's, 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 the English is not believable as the Arabic is. You hear it in English, you don't, you cannot, and, and anyway, since this is being recorded, I think that's uh, useful. Uh, here. That the old woman, I'll, I have to review to, to backtrack again and then read the Arabic for the part. That the old woman appears to men without ihtisham. What is ihtisham? Ihtishim. Without being wearing her modest clothes. And if it was haram for the young woman to appear before men, it would have also been haram for the old woman. وَلَكِنَّهُ أَمْرُ أَفْرَطَ فِيهِ الْمُتَعَدُّونَ حَدَّ الْغِيرَةِ إِلَى سُوءِ الْخُلْقِ وَضِيقِ الْفِطَنِ فَصَارَ عِنْدَهُمْ كَالْحَقِّ الْوَاجِبِ So, rather, it is simply a matter, and mutaaduna means those who are unfair or unjust, the extremists, have exceeded the limits of proper jealousy, to the realm of simply bad manners. Su al khulq means bad manners. Wadiq al fitan means a stupidity. And in other words, they're stupid. And consequently, they have, they have, it, it, this stupidity has become as if it is a mandatory truth. Now, let's stay with the Jahis for a little bit more because he's an interesting fellow. I wish if the circumstances that didn't happen to me, what I was planning to do was bring two manuscripts, one from Cairo and one from Damascus, saying the same thing. One was from the 5th century Hishra and the other from the 7th century Hishra, but by women jurists, making the same type of argument. But because they're not published, you have to get the microfilm and getting the microfilm from Damascus or Egypt is exactly, do you have the saying, getting the milk of the bird? In Egypt, in Arabic, you say, getting the milk of the bird. Yes, like the milk of the bird. Yeah, level of the Anyway, it's, it's, it's mean, I mean, you have to work for about six months before they'll send you a microfilm. And I was planning to get the microfilm and then print it out from the manuscripts and share it with you, but um, I I couldn't. Circumstances happened, and and um, but I, inshallah it will happen, and I, I will publish it. So Jahis goes on to say, it is essential. Where's the man? Oh, well, they're coming. Straight. <laughs> It is essential that now no one is forbidden to look at flowers. I'm so, I skipped several paragraphs. I mean, look how much I skipped all of this. So I, I, and here is what I'm trying to say. So I can't really show, share with you the real joy of this text as it should be. It is essential that no one is forbidden to look at flowers and plants and to walk around in the greenery and to breathe in, and to breathe in the air. All of this is allowed unless he or she, you should say, extends his or her hands towards it. In other words, you can walk around, you can smell the flowers, but don't start plucking them. If you didn't know, it's not Islamic to kill flowers for the purpose of killing flowers. But anyway, that's, that's environmental law. <laughs> but if he touches as much as a single seed without paying its due, then he has committed something that is not allowed and he has eaten out of what is forbidden. So it is when conversing with female, with female, with, uh, he, he, he translates it as female entertainers, which, <laughs> uh, so it is with conversing with women, joking with them, 
shaking their hands and looking at them. فَلَابُدْ مِمَّا أَشَمَّ ذَلِكَ كُلُّ حَلَمْ مَا لَمْ يَمُدْ لَهُ يَدًا فَإِذَا فإذا مد يدا إلى مثقال حبة من خردل بغير حقها فعل ما لا يحل. القيام. القيام does mean um, entertainer but it, it, in eloquence you, you can re, it, it's, a, it's a term of uh, phrase. It's like saying the fair lady, my fair lady. So it's, it's the same type of thing. So he says, this is the same as conversing with them and joking with them. Incidentally, jo uh, now, and shaking their hands. And for those of you surprised, there are Islamic schools that say shaking hands is not haram. And so on as long as no haram is forbidden. I think that's enough for the song. No haram as long as no haram is committed, I'm sorry. Okay, the Risala goes on and on and on. It's about 56 pages. So here is Azhar. So we know from this that the discourse existed not only in the first age, of course, Israhid is responding to a reality that is before him. And he is very upset about something and he is responding to this something. And he is addressing this problem and debating with those that he thinks are denying women the right. Now, if I would have had my manuscripts, I would have been able to show you the same debate in the 5th century and the 7th century, but made by women this time. Now, the women do not, in fact, one of the, the 7th century manuscripts, she says that she doesn't like to shake the hands of men because they're often dirty. <laughs> they, they, they often don't wash their hands and they're dirty. So, but... She argues that basically it's it's the counter argument of and you see in the markets that they never know what to buy and what to not buy and you can't tell them to go buy anything from the market and they will never do it right and on what basis do they say then that we are this and that and so there is a discourse that is going on. They mean women. Hmm? Yeah, talking men women. No, that on what basis are they men? saying that we are inadequate or something like that. So what the important point here is not, again I emphasize, is not the fact that Islam, and I emphasize this because I hate the fact, and in, with my students, anyone that does that gets an automatic F. I mean, I fail them, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This is not an argument that Islam liberated women and always treated them with dignity and honor and so on. This is an argument that the discourse existed. That the roots of an Islamic feminist discourse existed in Islamic history, not the feminist neo-colonial discourse that exists in the modern age. When a student comes, and I and I saw often when I when the university, I mean I, I don't teach on a regular basis. I teach basically, basically on semester on semester basis. When the university asks me to teach a case and we deal with this area, and I say, very simple question: What was the point of assigning such and such and such and such? And a student who is usually a Muslim, yeah. non-Muslims will say, well, such and such and such. But, you know, every once in a while you get some Muslim undergraduates who, you know, very gray, and, they, and then they write, well, it's to prove that Islam liberated women and that Allah did this and Allah did And he thinks, because I'm a Muslim, I'm going to say, yes, brother, I love you, and here, hey, I give him an F. <laughs> and I've had a lot of Muslims come and say, how could you do this to us? And I said, if a non-Muslim said the same argument, I give them an F. 
and this is exactly what the response deserves. So let's now go back to the Khawarij and the woman who lived prayer, who conquered the town and lived prayer. Now, is she the wacko? Well, the Khawarij was sort of semi-crazy anyway, right? But I say that again, of course, tongue in cheek, because the Khawarij became the Ibadiyya. And the Ibadiyya produced a fascinating jurisprudential legacy. Well, I can't read this, I'm sorry. Among them, Al Musanna bin Hajj al Talibin, Mawsu'at al Sharia. So the Khawarij, in fact, produced a whole jurisprudential tradition. And in the, in the jurisprudential tradition of the Ibadiyya, the Khawarish sect, in fact, they say that women can lead prayer, can be a judge, and be a khalif. Now, we all know that they rebelled against the Imam Ali. And I think they were idiotic. But they also rebelled against Muawiyah. So they probably were not as idiotic as, as one would seem. But we also know that they went around killing a lot of Muslims because they considered them kuffar. So on the other hand, they were rather idiotic. But again, they seem to have, by the 3rd and 4th century, moderated their tendencies quite a bit and learned how to live with others without, without murder, basically. So, and they produced quite a respectable legal engineer. Now, let us look at a very interesting point. When Islamic jurisprudence arose, there were schools of Islamic jurisprudence that arose in Medina, in Basra, in Baghdad, in Damascus in Mecca, there was a Cairo school. The Mecca school became irrelevant and sort of died off. The Medina school became prominent and eventually became the Maliki school. The Basra school predominated and eventually became the Hanafi school. And the Damascus school, the school of Al-Zai, eventually died off and became extinct. Now, Imam al-Shafi was all over. He was in Damascus, he was in Egypt, and he was in Medina. That's not the point. The point is that you had several localities producing Islamic law, thinking about Islamic law. In these localities, several schools of jurisprudence arose. In Awza'i, for example, who was in Damascus, and who was one of the most prominent, died off. Is Zahiriya, the school that is one of the most prominent, died off. The earliest school that became established was the Ja'fari. That was the earliest school. And Ja'fariya, the Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, taught an Imam Malik. And then the Malikiya became, and the Hanafiya became the, two, the, 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 the second two established schools. In other words, Hanafiya Hanafi and Malikiya established themselves pretty much at the same time. Then, after that, Shafi'iya established itself, Imam al-Shafi'i. And then, Al-Hanbaliya established itself. But what is really important to note is that this was not an automatic process. This was an intense process of dialogue among the different schools of thought. And I'm going to say this again tomorrow because I know some of the people who are going to be here tomorrow, they mean it's not the same thing. So, we had several schools. The school of the Imam, the school of Abu Sufyan al Thawri, the school of Ibn Abi Thawr, the school of Al Awza'i. In fact, you know what? Um, no, I'll do 
do this for tomorrow. Remind me tomorrow to look up the names of 30 different schools. Tomorrow, inshallah, I can probably recite about, I don't promise you 30, but I promise you between 15 and 30, of different schools, and each of them was in many ways equal to the Hanbali, the Hanafi school, the Hanbali school, the Maliki school, the Shafi school. In other words, Al Awza'i was a contemporary of the students of Abu Hanifa, and there was common debate among them the, the famous Radda al Azir al Awza'i. And one of the most established schools was the Taban, the school of Taban. For your information, the Hanbali school nearly died out. The Zahiri school, which was the most literalist and conservative school, died out. And it died out primarily because of its conservatism. The Hanbali school nearly died out. Except for the fact that Allah blessed them with Ibn Qudama, who wrote a book called Al Mughni. And Al Mughni literally saved the Hanbali school from extinction. Because it was such a brilliant book that it brought the Hanbali school back to the, to the fore again. Uh, anyway, all of that is sort of for my own entertainment, because I love this stuff. Now... Are you ever going to um, also address the, the reaction of the Quran had to the Islamic Revolution? Because it's been around for so long. Well, I want to address it from a different perspective. So. Now, all of this, I'm trying to establish the grounds the background to make a point, at all I hope, that when you imagine in the first century Hijra, the second century Hijra, about, yeah, by, by a simple count, about 150 different schools, they start fettering out, not because some of them are inferior to others, but because of various socio-economic circumstances, as well as um, um, historical accident. So, for example, in Awza'i, it just so happened that he was in Damascus at the time. And it just so happened that Damascus was not a center of commerce as Baghdad and Basra were. The Hanafis were in Baghdad and Basra. And consequently, the Hanafis became established, and in Awza'i didn't. The Meccan school, the Fuqaha in Mecca, Mecca did not become as important as Medina after the Khilafah, uh, 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 after the, the Khilafah moved, and consequently the Meccan schools died off. But the Medinan schools in the forms of Al-Anas ibn Malik lived. Now, the interesting thing about the Tabari was that the Tabari, I would say, the equivalent in terms of his jurisprudential capacity, definitely the equal or the match to an Imam al-Shafi himself. So, if a Tabari, through an accident of history, that school did not die off, there would have been Tabaris around, followers of a Tabari. And there would have been followers of a Sawriya, and followers of al and so on. Okay. So wh why am I making, why am I going on and on about this? Because in Imam Abi Sawr, And Imam Abi Saud rules, who is one of these early Muslim schools, Imam Abi Saud, who is one of these early Muslim schools, rules that a woman can lead man in prayer without 
without limits, without limitations. Jawaz Imam of the Mar'a Lil Nisa Wal Rijal Ala Al Itlaq. But he says, in leading the prayer, she stands behind the man, leads the prayer from behind the line. Because the illa, for where she stands, is not her superiority or inferiority. It is the fact of her modesty. And consequently, if modesty is the problem, then she can leave prayer from behind the lines, and that's fine. And he based it. Prayer, one of the promises of prayer is never go ahead of the imam. So, it would be based on the problem. No, no, I, no, never go ahead of the imam means that you never, you, you never, like, do sujood before the right. imam gets the floor. Right, but well, you can see the woman, how could you ensure that you always not go ahead? A good question, but the, 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 about, the point about never go ahead of the imam is not. It's not a central one. In other words, that some people don't see it. Some people don't see it. It's a big conversation. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the point is, is that even the point about never going ahead of the Imam, the only people who said that your prayer would be negated if you if your head touches the floor before the Imam are the Hanbal. Other than that, no one else said that. What do you say? What do you say? Now, and he relies on the following hadith. Now, where is my... Where is my... Uh, where is Usama? Oh, no, this is not Usama. This is uh, Mu'nis. Is that Mu'nis? Yes. Where is Mu'nis? This is a translation of the occultist scholar Mu'nis. <laughs> um... And he relies on the following evidence. The narration of Abdul Rahman ibn, ibn Khalad al Umm Waraq. So, in other words, the hadith is related from what? Umm Waraq. Umm Waraq is a woman. And she relates the following hadith. That the Prophet used to visit her in her home. Okay, yeah. I'll read from the translation. In the course of a long hadith, the Prophet used to visit her, Umm Warqa, in her house. Is that the law? Mixing. Yeah. And he had someone give a then for her. Well, yeah, he, he used to basically. Anyway. And he and, and he, the prophet again, commanded her to lead her household in her prayers. So he commanded her to lead prayer in her home. And Abdul Rahman said, I saw that she led the Mu'addin, the man that was doing the Azan, in prayer. And he was an old man. So what is apparent from this is that she used to lead her Mu'addin, which indicates the permissibility of women leading men in prayer. Second, the general hadith, the generality of the hadith, a group should be led by the most versed among them in the Qur'an وَبِعَمُومْ قَوْلِهِ Not in the Qur'an, alayhi salam meaning that it's a hadith. In the Qur'an. وَيَعُمُّ الْقَوْمُ أَقْرَأُهُمْ بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ The... Well, actually, no, he's right. Yeah, yeah, that, Qur'an, yeah. which, is, which is the most versed among them in the Qur'an. Most knowledgeable <laughs> in the Qur'an. Yeah. Yeah. That it is... That it is general and not restricted to men, which means that it includes men and women. In other words, the hadith that says people should be led by that who is most knowledgeable, says people. 
the umu qawm. It doesn't ma say men or women. And three, yeah. and whoever can be led by a man can also be an imam to the man. In other words, there is a qaida that says, if you are allowed to be led by someone, then you are also allowed to lead that someone in prayer. This is the qaida. So, uh, Imam Abi Sal says, well, if they can be led, then they can lead. This is the qaida we have from the Prophet. We have no restrictions. Now here is the part that you won't like. And also, by analogy to the status of the slave, since it is permissible for a slave to lead free men in prayer, logically, women should be allowed to lead men as well, since the status of women is superior to that of a slave. Since the slave can be killed avenging the death of a woman, but a woman cannot be killed avenging the death of a slave. So in other words, he is using a deductive process of reasoning. And this is, by the way, a good translation of that. That the status of a slave, the slave can lead free men in prayer. A slave <coughs> is inferior to st in status to women. Why? Because if a woman kills a slave, she cannot be killed. But a slave kills a woman, the slave can be killed. Consequently, how can we allow that who is inferior in status to lead, but that who is superior in status not to lead? This is the opinion of Abu Sawr. Abu Sawr becomes, it's a school of thought that dies off. It's 10, right? Abi Saur is a school that dies off. And Abu Saur is joined in this opinion by no one less than Al Tabari. Al Imam Al Tabari. Now, Imam Al Tabari is extremely important. Number one, he wrote that. Abi Saur. It is a school that dies off. And Abu Thawr is joined in this opinion by no one less than Al Tabari. Al Imam Al Tabari. Now, Imam Al Tabari is extremely important. Number one, he wrote the Tafsir of the Quran, the very famous Tafsir, Tafsir Al Tabari. Number two, he wrote Tariq Al Tabari. And number three, he wrote several books of fiqh and hadith. But none of them survived. And you know why none of them survived? Because an Imam al Tabari, who was quite controversial in his time, in asserting in his discourse not only about women but about several other issues, one of them was women, was opposed by the Hanbalis. And the Hanbalis Finally, not that I have anything against the Hanbalis, I, I put a disclaimer that I have anything against the Hanbalis. But that in fact, the historical fact of the matter is the Hanbalis then raided his home, killed him, burned his house, and started the purge where they burned his books. The only two books that survived from Imam al-Tabari is his history, and his, uh, his tarikh, his history, and his tafsir. All his works on fiqh died off. Now, Imam al-Tabari had more followers in the third Islamic century than the Hanbalis and the Hanafis and the Maliki. 
combined. Then how could all his books have been destroyed? They should have been dispersed among the people. He, it, it was... Or his food. It, it was... It could, it, the historical circumstances where he was not a very diplomatic fellow. In other words, he offended too many princes and was rather, like Ibn Hazm, um, was rather a loose tongue. And consequently, his students managed to save only these two books, and that's a miracle, believe me, because the tafsir is huge and the tamik is huge. But it was made a point and he was dispersed only, by the way, in the Damascus, Baghdad, and Arabia. As far as we can tell, he never reached Egypt. And the only reason that his Tariq and Tafsir survived is because copies of his Tariq and Tafsir reached Egypt. And in Egypt, they didn't care. In Tuzan Tabari was, who cared? So that's the only reason it survived. And in fact, the manuscripts of his Tariq and Tafsir is in Egypt. But the material that was around Baghdad and Damascus was, was pretty much uh, collected and destroyed. Now, we have evidence. Now, someone told me this. I mean, jurist told me this. That when he was in Damascus, he saw a manuscript of his book on Fiqh. And he swears on the life of his children that it's there. Now, I am willing to someday take a trip to Damascus and search it, and if it's true, then it must be edited and published. So, we, in other words, we don't know. But anyway, the Imam al school eventually dies. So, now <coughs> that just by the sheer numbers of people we lost, I have proven that this, in fact, is to be quite a demanding lecture and I believe that anything demanding has to be tedious and has to be exhausting. Without exhaustion, you don't learn anything. Anything that entertains you is probably not good for you. Anything that you feel exhilarated as you are absorbing is probably not a good idea. I am one of these people who very much believes in suffering. Now, let us, finally, I will get to one more Islamic discourse. So you see the other side of the coin, and then I'm going to get to the modern discourse, and then I'm going to end it, except for anyone who has questions, I'm available if you're still conscious. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to, uh, almost sort of keeps me with a, with a tremendous amount of energy until the class finishes and then I collapse. Okay, so, Now, how many of you know in the Taymiyyah? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Any friends of his? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's... Uh, I don't need to scare you more than... Now, didn't someone translate the Taymiyyah for Okay, hold on. Uh, Didn't we give it to uh, yes, sir? Uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. No, I don't want it to get to you. Ah, yeah. Okay. No. Here is a fatwa. Listen to the fatwa carefully. Can't I, I mean, it's, it's a shame that, uh, uh, even if I have to say so, um, give me, I mean, I will take a copy of this lecture and just transcribe it, and I think my article is done. <laughs> so, it's very good. I'm, I'm happy uh, we were doing this. Huh? Well, it's only you should have, and I'm not grateful for anyone else. <laughs> um, okay, here's the fatwa by Ibn Taymiyyah. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah is, is quite late. He's in the uh, 6th, 7th century Islam. So, he is asked the following question. If
if a man is alone with a woman and she refuses to have intercourse with and if a man is alone with a woman and she <laughs> refuses to have intercourse with him then consequently we know that her right to the mah has not been established in the in the madhab of the Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and such the said Qadi Abi Yala wa Abi Barakat and others and so on so on so on now it says and if she acknowledges that she has forbidden him intercourse with her then they are, they are agreed that she does not have a claim to her mah and he does not owe her support as long as she remains in that state. If she hates him and desires someone else, i.e. for marriage, then she should ransom him. Ransom? <laughs> then she should earn her liberty, not ransom, by agreeing to pay back part of the mahr if she in fact receives it. What can we sort of deduct from the statement? What would seem to be a reasonable deduction from the statement? <coughs> Well, yeah, I so said the first one, but uh, I'll move on. It's because it's in the book of books. Part of the situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We can deduct that we deduce that the monitor doesn't become operational until after the confirmation. Yeah, but that's too weak. You can deduce that yeah. the wife has a right to receive a sexual intercourse with her husband. On the money. On the one, we can deduce from that that she can refuse. She doesn't get the lamas. Okay. Now, now notice here. He says that Malik was Shafi, wa Abu Hanifa. All of them agreed on that point. Agreed on what? Agreed on what point? The mahna point. Is it the mahna point or the non-consensual sexual? The mahna point. Okay, maybe you'll we'll figure it out in this, this fact. This is a real fact. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah was asked, a man married a woman and he wrote a book on her and he paid her the mahna completely and a part of it remained unpaid. And then he asked her to come in his house so he can have intercourse with her. So she refused and she went to her aunt and her aunt hit her. And the question is, can we force her to go to her man's house for the khul? The khul means intercourse. And force her aunt to surrender her. Ibn Taymiyyah says she does not have the right to refuse intercourse and this is by the agreement of all their imma and her aunt cannot protect her and no one other than her aunt can protect her and in fact her aunt should be punished by Ta'zir for, protect, for, for preventing her from doing her wajib and her aunt should be forced to surrender her to her husband. What? Oh, okay, basically it's this. A man, a man comes to Ibn Taymi and says, 
Iman wrote Kataba al Kitabu. He married this woman. He paid her mah, except for a part that remained unpaid. Now, then she refused intercourse. She refused to consummate the marriage. I, I don't know why I got into that word. <coughs> consummate. Upon refusal to consummate the marriage, she left and hid in her aunt's house. Can we force her aunt to surrender her to her husband, and can she be forced to consummate the marriage? And Ibn Taymiyyah says, yes, she can be forced to, she can be forced to surrender to her husband, where he would consummate the marriage, and her aunt must be forced to surrender her, and her aunt must be punished for hiding. <coughs> so the previous thing was about that. <coughs> so what's going on? That doesn't become the primary issue. If it had been completely paid, then one might say then that she would have to complete her obligation. Even A, marries what man B, he pays her the mah, but not all of it, but then she runs away and hides at her aunt's house, and he is asked, can we force her to consummate the marriage? And he says yes. So there's a contradiction. <laughs> well, he said the uh, MR agreed in the first place and the second place. Both of them are first time. Oh, first time. So Both of them are first time. Are you trying to show us that these don't match? Yeah. 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 Or, are we, or do they match and we're trying to... We're trying uh, this to is what I'm going to match. do for Saturday or Sunday. I mean, the people who stuck this line are sort of, sort of unfair. The, the people who left early is the ones that I should sort of dunk on them. <laughs> but this is what I'm going to be doing. Basically, giving you puzzles mm -hmm. to solve. Is it a I mean, according to me, this isn't a this puzzle, is puzzle, this is puzzle. Is puzzle. Is puzzle whose piece is going to fit. I mean, this is like, yeah, this is, this is... Okay, yeah. fine, there's a contradiction. But then, what is going on? So, I'm... Wait. Is, he, is he just simply stupid? No, that's what I'm trying to figure out. It's like, is there a law that that is somehow inherent in the first example that we had that still does follow through on the second example, making <coughs> the second... What the, what the guy said, legal. Making me, me, it saying like, okay, that's right of him to say, yes, force that woman to go back. You're is there a law that we're looking for like that? Or are we just seeing that these are just contradicting each other? Or, or not, a, not a law that way, but I mean... Like, You're saying, is there some legal reason? No, 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 sorry. Law, I mean, I mean like... Like... Regulation. Yeah, like a... Yeah, is, like, there, is there a is, legal reason is there for just a distinction? A, is there... Right? Yeah, I guess what I meant by law was just a, a continuous thought. I mean, is there is there a uh, is there a truth? Well, no, it's like like it's just like a physics law which like applies. No, one thing in the second case, has the woman given back her mahar voluntarily or hasn't she? In the second. She hasn't. She hasn't, and she doesn't have the right to mm -hmm. uh, cancel the marriage contract. So there is one possibility that this woman who hid in her aunt's the house. The primary difference is, is that in the first instance, she has a right to exercise her right to say no and give back to her. But in the second instance, she, she doesn't exercise that right. She instead flees without exercising so her right. So in to other words, so if you don't exercise your right. Then there's a possibility that in the second scenario, she took the money, grabbed the money, and went and hid in her aunt's house, and refused to return. That's a possibility. Now, why do I bring this? But wouldn't the matter issue be brought up in the first one? Sir? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Because there is a background to the fatwa that we could be in fact, in fact, 
if you want to know, I did research the background of this right now. And the background is, in fact, that this woman was going around doing this. Oh, so then she's keeping Yeah, I mean, this is sort of a secret to the trade that you're not supposed to, because then you kill the story from the beginning. She did it with three men. She would take them off and run and hide in her aunt's house and keep them up. Well, this is why I brought it up. Some person comes to you and doesn't read to you the fairest part and reads to you the, the, this fatwa. Do you see what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. Reads to you this fatwa as Islamic law. And he says, Sister Ibn Taymiyyah says, mm -hmm. I have a right to force. Uh, you I'm have to learn to ask the question, am I getting the full story or not? That's the whole point. Okay, then. What's the conflict? Yes. Okay, but why would he then force her to go back to her husband? Why couldn't he? Wasn't the law be she yeah, has to return the money? Well, that is the law. But that's the whole point. If, if she doesn't say, yeah, but that's that not a right kind of lesson. Well, well, order well, from race means but that, prostitution. No, mm -hmm. the, but the whole point is that if you don't know the laws, then people can change what you think and they. Can Whether Ibn Taymiyyah was right or wrong, that's beside the point. Situation. That's quite beside the point. I mean, we could. You could agree with him or disagree with him, whether he was wise in what he said or not. He thought, for whatever reason, that the best way to get this woman to stop doing what she's doing, because it's not it's not a crime, in other words, it's not an offense that you could punish for, is to say, okay, fine, you're going to play this game, then you've got to act as a wife. And he, Ibn Taymiyyah, evidently, was convinced that this is the right solution. That is beside the point. That is his opinion, and he is entitled to his opinion as well as you are entitled to your opinion. The point is exactly that. That even if Ibn Taymiyyah reached the wrong decision, even if Ibn Taymiyyah states something clearly, one, there is a possibility he's right, and there is a possibility he's wrong. Two, is that there is a possibility we don't know the context and we don't know the circumstances. Three, is the possibility that there are other rules of law that must be considered in considering this point. And consequently, the whole point of this exercise is not whether Ibn Taymiyyah was correct or not. I don't care. The point of this exercise is how do you deal with a text, as we said. How do you deal with the written word? Now, note here the, this, this footnote. But getting back to your first story, uh, there seems to be a very clear relationship between consummation and money. Yeah. So that still holds. I mean, if you, the, with, I, don't want, I don't want this to become too legalistic because then we'll get into law, and the law of consummation and the law of mahar, and then I'll tell you, and I, and I mean, I, I'll, I could cut the discussion short and just tell you this, that the law is, among all the schools, is that the woman, in, as long as the woman can return the mah and refuse to consummate the marriage, and then there's an annulment except for the Hanbali schools, and in fact, Ibn Taymiyyah himself, despite of what he says in the first paragraph, later on, in his other books, does not, does not agree that the woman has a right to refuse. Okay? So in other words, when he claims that all the schools agree with him, all the schools don't agree with him. And this is, this is, but this is a more subtle and, and a higher level point. That when do you really know when someone says وَالطَّفَقَ الْأَئِمَّةِ or وَهَذَا بِإِجْمَاعِ الْأَئِمَّةِ When is this really an ijma' or when is it simply claimed for authority? <laughs> but I don't want to get this because I, you, can't, you, you can't overload the system with information and maintain your sanity. I mean, I, I, I have to keep in mind the... So the law is... Or, other than the Hanbali school, as long as she returns the mah, 
she does not have to consummate the marriage. Now, as to forcible mar intercourse, that's a different matter, and that's a different issue, and you can ask me about it tomorrow. Because I want to bring it up when there's the, the, the full thing. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah, we get from this, is a little bit of... And anyway, those of you who know Ibn Taymiyyah, I mean, who, who here ever read anything by Ibn Taymiyyah? Okay. What's your impression of Ibn Taymiyyah? When it comes to women. Ultra conservative. But not only that, he didn't like them very much. <laughs> I mean, quite bluntly, he never married. Not that he didn't like them. He felt very threatened by them, I thought. He well, thought that well, women were a threat to his. You know, he yeah. felt that he pretty much threatened, I agree, and a lot of men who don't like women are threatened. So that, that is mm -hmm. sort of the fact. But because he's a jurist, and I have to respect jurists, and I always <laughs> honor and revere jurists, regardless of who they are and what they say, I will use the respectful terms of saying just he didn't like them very much. Uh, in, in my madhab, jurists are the inheritors of the Prophet, and you disagree with them, but you never insult them. Now, of course, you guys can do whatever you want, as long as you don't insult me. Um, now, Ibn Taymiyyah never married, and he was once given a slave girl, which he never touched. And she went and object and complained to the Qadi that this guy never touches me. And the Qadi ordered him, you're not doing your rights towards this woman, you've got to give her to someone who will. So he went and he gave her to one of his students or something like that, and, and so on. So we get a sense of who Ibn Taymiyyah was when it came to that. And by the way, in another fatwa, uh, and here uh, we don't have any minors, so it's okay. Uh, when Ibn Taymiyyah was once asked, also in this fatwa, a woman once went to him and complained to him that her husband doesn't satisfy her sexually and she wants a divorce. And he said, well, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, I want to know what is the minimum that my husband is obligated to do before I can have a divorce. And he said, once every three months. As long as it's once every three months, then there is no divorce. So, all of that is read as text. And all of that are read as thoughts as manifestations of a civilization. Now, finally, I want to go over the fact, although Ibn Taymiyyah evidently does not like women very much, he is asked the following question. A woman came to him and said, my husband says that I have to serve him. And my husband says that I have to serve him. I have, in other words, to clean and wash and cook and all of that. And I want to know, is the service that I perform to my husband equal to the service that a slave is obligated to perform and a servant is obligated to perform or not. Then he said, so he answered in the following way. What is known amongst us, and here pay attention to the word, word. ma huwa ma'roof, what is known amongst us is that service of a woman to the husband is obligatory. But some of them said that she only owes him the minimal service, khidmat yasir. And some said she owes him 
serveth according to what is the custom of the area that she lives in. And consequently, she owes him the service according to the custom of her class status, her social status, her time period, and her locality. And this is what I believe to be correct. And I believe, Ibn Taymiyyah says, that that the amount of service that a wife is obligated to perform to a husband vary according to variety of the circumstances. So the Bedouin has different the service of a Bedouin is not like the service of a villager. And the service the service of a strong woman is like not is not like the service of a weak woman. And the service of a knowledgeable woman is not like the service of an ignorant woman. Now, one, we notice here that Ibn Taymiyyah starts the response by what? What is known amongst us? The response starts by what is known amongst us. I know at this point you're getting exhausted and, you know, Hang in there with me. If, believe me, not that, um, um, I'll, I'll, okay, um, after I turn off the thing. He starts the fatwa itself by saying what? <coughs> not by, not by, did he cite any hadith? Did he cite any Quranic verse? In fact, if he would cite the sunnah, it's a sunnah of what? No, the sunnah. What does the sunnah? What did the Prophet do? He used to sew, right? Cook and clean. He doesn't cite any of that. What he cites is what is accustomed amongst us. Consequently, as you will learn, inshallah, tomorrow and after tomorrow, he is putting you on notice. This is a custom based and he is quite explicit in saying it changes according to circumstances, the time, the education, and the class. But this is coming from the same faqih that doesn't like women very much. And this is why I wanted to share the fatwa with you. It has nothing to do with conservatism or liberalism. The Islamic civilization was is very rich, and here I am winding up. The Islamic civilization, as I said, I'm going to finish exactly at 11 o'clock. <coughs> the Islamic civilization is extremely rich. What it produced is a homogeny of complexity and diversity. Stereotypes and categorizations are not going to get you anywhere. An attempt to find conservatives, liberals, versus this or that, it will only render you in the idiocy of modernism and postmodernism. The Western civilization and modernism and postmodernism is a tagging civilization. In other words, it's a civilization that bases its very means of production, and here I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that, oh, you know, revolution or anything like that. What I'm saying is, understand what is going on. <coughs> it's a civilization that is based on production, on, in, on, on, on simplifying the means of production, maximizing production, on efficiency, and even on maximizing means of understanding and efficiency even in knowledge. And consequently, the method, the methodology of knowledge pursued, for example, in the United States as opposed to Germany or France, the United States and Britain as opposed to Germany and France, is an attempt to find categorization. 
to find schools and, and discover classes and discovers clear dividing lines where you can sort of say, aha, this belongs to that, and this belongs to this, and this belongs to that. And it is part of the whole economic structure. My argument to you, that's fine. If you want to live your life like that, that's your choice. But if you want to understand the complexity of Islamic civilization like that, you will not succeed. It doesn't fit. And that is why a lot of Orientalists sound so idiotic. Some of them who manage to capture the complexity are very good, like Barbara Johansson in Germany, or uh, like Michael Cook, even though he has some crazy ideas. But anyway, he's very good. He captures the complexity in the civilization, the richness, the diversity, even within the individual. One faqih, just because you know his opinion over one issue, you cannot predict his opinion on another issue. Because no one could predict that Ibn Taymiyyah would say that a woman's service to his, her husband would vary according to the culture and time. This sounds like a wacko liberal's talking, not Ibn Taymiyyah. When people speak this way, they say, oh, well, they're liberal. You don't understand Islam. Now, I don't claim to understand Islam. What I've done is, I brought Islamic texts and shared them with you. You go figure out what Islam says. You go figure out Islam. I can figure it out for myself and I will keep it to myself. But that is all that I hope for. Before we conclude, I want to leave you with a note. You've seen the broad spectrum of complexity over the issue of women and Islam. I didn't use any slogans. I didn't use any rhetoric. I didn't cite any of the early stuff. Now let us get an example of the modern discourse. This is the advance, right? Fatwa. The advance. He was asked whether, this is actually the fatwa itself, whether women driving a car is halal or haram. <laughs> he responded, it is haram because it leads to corruptions that are obvious. Among them is khalwa. Among them is sufur, immodesty. Among them is mixing with men without an excuse. Among them is committing the forbidden. Among them is committing the forbidden. And that is why all of this, the Sharia has forbidden what leads to haram. And so what leads to haram is haram. And that is why Allah Azza wa Jal and the Prophet ordered women to stay in their homes and to preserve the hijab and not to show their beauties because all of that is corruption. And then he cites several Quranic verses to that effect. The Quranic verses that we usually hear. And then he says, no man has ever been in isolation with a woman without the shaitan being a third. This is a hadith. So the sharia has always forbidden what leads to haram. And what leads to haram is haram. He's being somewhat repetitive here. And made it, and made it punishable by the most um, uh, strict of punishments. And among those things that lead to the most definite corruption, and immorality is women the driving car. And this cannot, and this is rather obvious. And it is rather the ignorance of people with the ahkam al-sharia, with the laws of sharia, and with the rules of Islam, 
and with the morality of the Quran that leads them to follow the ways of the laws and error. Error. Whatever. And that is why a lot of those who are sick in their hearts and who love corruption and who love looking at women go on talking about this matter because what they want is the opportunity to enjoy looking at women. As the Prophet has said, I have not left a greater test to men after me more than women. And he used to be asked, the Prophet he says, what is the best thing that is going to come after you? And he says, such and such and such. And he says, And he says then, and what is the worst that will come to me? He says, people who invite to messages that sound like they are just, but these people are unjust and the seekers of corruption and error. And consequently, I am imploring every Muslim to, for, to protect himself from corruption and to not spread the evil of women driving in cars <laughs> which would lead to a certain haram. Now, this is fatwa. <laughs> now, there is a fatwa that In the, in the, with Bin Baz, uh, they're just uh, basically whenever you yeah. don't like it or... No, but when someone issues a fatwa, is it particular? Huh? Oh, it's just a particular case? Is it one case or that case? Is it just a general... No, 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 no. The show is not wrong. Okay, then. What do you think of what? Mm -hmm. uh, you mean um, an Islamic civilization or now? No, an Islamic civilization is basically that you have ijazas from scholars that have ijazas. In other words, you may certify. If you're not certified, it's like exactly, exactly like the practice of law. If you don't pass the bar and you don't have a license, you can't do it. And, but at that time, they're licensed for their jazz. Nowadays, it's basically whoever the government allows to be the spokesman. Okay. <laughs> okay. Before doing that, I, I want to get rid with the fatwa of the bad and bad scholars. He's also asked about, now, I, it, listen, it, uh, my, our sheikhs, and I think it's, it's, it's not, I think, it is a hadith, that la hayat al there's no embarrassment in religion. And as I told you, our sheikhs will talk about the most embarrassing things in the world, with a straight face, men and women sitting there, and not even as much as a smirk, or a smile on their life. Uh, on their on their wife on their wife as well. That's sort of forcing us. <laughs> but anyway, he has asked also, and I don't I don't I seem to have misplaced it. But anyway, I have this fatwa memorized. It's in the same book, so you, you can check it. Uh, for the sake, this is much more fatwa in Baz, volume four, volume four, and. Uh, volume 3. Go check it. He's asked if wearing a bra is haram or halal. If you're wearing what? A bra. A bra. Referred to as a suntian in his terminology. Now, he responds to that fatwa by saying that, and here exactly is his word. So this one I've, I've talked so much of it now. 
if it is to give the false, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Some women wear the bra to give the false impression of larger chests. And that is a form of deceit and consequently that is haram. But if it is worn for medical reasons, that is halal. Now, I'm using the best because I, I think that's the other extreme. Then I have a fatwa about the khtilat, which he basically says is absolutely forbidden. No man and woman should ever be in any mixed company. And then finally the fatwa about whether a woman can work and, and can go out in the street without wearing um, the abaya or this cloth. And he says a woman can neither work nor go out in the street without the abaya. Um, she can work in her home, of course, like if she wants to be foster or something like that. Now, the interesting thing about Bin Baz and his fatwa is, look at the, well, we can't see. The style of the fatwa is structured in a certain fashion. Talk or onyx verse. Talk or onyx verse. Talk, hadith, talk. The Quranic verse, when you are approaching it, you ask, are any of them on point? Do any of them specifically address a bra or a car or work? No. What is he doing at that point? He is deducting. And he is using certain methods of deduction. Consequently, a deduction can be met by what? Counter deduction. The only difference, in my view, between the discourse of this age and the discourse of the past age is that this discourse in the contemporary age seems to be, again, and I emphasize this point, a knee-jerk reaction discourse. Basically, what I've said again and again, it's a Coca-Cola machine type of mentality or hamburger knowledge type of mentality. You want a quick fix and a quick answer. You want to put the coin in, press the button, and the <coughs> coke comes out, a ready-made solution. You solve the problem. No points of view, no arguments, no schools, no give and take, no debate, there is right and wrong, black and white, Islam is known, kufr is known. What I am saying is, this is, in fact, in my view, a postmodern or modern mutation and corruption of Islam because Islam was never like that. And the form of halakha is over exactly at 11 o'clock. <laughs> now you are ready, you are free to leave or free to hang around for a little bit or do whatever or do your thing or ask questions or where did it change? Where do we get from where we were having discourses and thinking and 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 you know getting getting somewhere to where we're you know in this um, black and white solution um, <laughs> age of like <laughs> nose rising? <laughs> well, I mean, I I have no special competence to answer that question. All I know is um, when I was growing up, it was not as bad 
uh, as it is now. Um, I grew up uh, um, and, and I know that among the circles of learning, among the shiuk and the halakat, uh, things were never black and white. Mm -hmm. And it was always a discourse. And I didn't teach myself this material. I was taught it. I can't claim credit for the ingenuity of going and discovering it. Um, but I also know that as I was growing up, political reality seemed to be more and more polarized, and camps seemed to be more and more divided. Um, as the economic and political situation became more desperate, the patience with argument and debate seemed to lessen and lessen. And we have a rule, in fact, in the Halakas, that you don't debate what, you don't reveal what you learn to the Am, to the general public. In other words, we would not share the knowledge uh, with the masses. It is only exclusive to those who get the licenses. Um, and we and we are told quite specifically it's because the political and economic circumstances are going to corrupt the knowledge and the circumstances are such that whatever you teach is going to be abused and misused for political ends not for the sake of any objective truth or any objective thought so there we all talk, took an oath of silence within our country I mean, in Egypt. What shocked me is when I came to the United States, and the political reality of American Muslims is not such. What shocked me is the vast amount, no, let me rephrase. I found Muslims in the United States more stupid than anything I've seen back home. More idiotic, Incapable of thought, incapable of knowledge. What kind of Muslims? I mean, are these Muslims yeah. that came from, or are these Muslims that grew up in? Well, you want, you want the, truth, uh, the truthful answer? Yeah, I think, yeah. Wow. Muslims that came from, definitely Muslims that grew up in, as well because they are carrying the cultural baggage of their parents. I'm not seeing any improvement in the quality of knowledge or the quality of thought. And it's, in fact, you are a minority. I mean, you are an extreme minority. You are not a majority. Some of the things that, that would be discussed very leisurely back home, I've learned to come to the United States and be afraid to mention. I mean, even something like clapping. I discovered for the first time in my life when I came to the United States that in an Islamic conference, if you clap, it's a catastrophe. First time I discovered that if you shake the hands of a woman in an Islamic conference, it would be a major catastrophe is here in the United States. In Egypt, some did it, some didn't. We, knew we respected those who didn't and those who did. I mean, it was understood. The first time I hear that it is a major disaster if you listen to any form of music, including in classical music, in any Islamic arena, it's a major disaster is here in the States. I remember mm -hmm. our sheikhs used to recite poetry, we used to memorize poetry, and my sheikhs used to like Umm Karsum and sit there and say, oh yes, Umm Karsum and Abdul Wahab and Najib al Rihani and what they said. And, they would sit there and yes, salam, ya aini, ya daily, and they would sit there and listen to all this stuff. And these were sheikhs who are much more, I mean, the, the people here compared to them know nothing. These are sheikhs who have licenses, who have ijazas, who, who, who know this material inside out. I come here and I discover that Islamic in Islamic arenas, you turn on some soft Hawaiian music in the background as you eat, and suddenly all hell breaks loose, and it is a major disaster. I've discovered in the United States that no woman can enter into a mosque 
without basically looking at the floor and walking next to a wall and hiding. And if she as much as tried to sort of more or less stand up or say anything in most mosques, it, it's a disaster. Now, I don't know how the heck Muslims in the United States got this way. This is only Arab mosques. That's not the same. Might, might be or might not. This is my experience. I mean, I've been doing this since 1982. And my experience has drawn me more and more into isolation. I mean, you can see the burnout and the bitterness in the way I'm talking. Yes, there are exceptions. Yes, in the LA, LA mosque, for example, I see that. Yes, in Amida, I see interactions and so on. But uh, and I, don't, I won't concede this Arab mosque into Pakistani mosques as well. Uh, there's, there's absolutely no difference in that regard. The fact of the matter is, is the, and most importantly, the so-called scholars here in the United States, the people, in, and this is why uh, the people who dominate the Islamic discourse tend to be um, demagogues. I mean, there are scholars, but not too many. So I, it's, it's, I mean, it's really your fate, especially the use. Uh, my job is to come to, to bring back the roots, to attempt to get you excited a little bit about your roots, about your heritage, and to tell you in very blunt fashion what I think, what my assessment, I might be completely wrong. Things might be very cheerful. It might be that in 10 years everyone here in the United States is going to convert and we're going to create the Khilafah again. It might be that California is right. It's just a matter of a few years, and <laughs> California is going to be declared a Khilafah. It might be. I'm just giving you my own perspective. And so it might be that I'm complete, and it might be that women here in the United States are completely liberated, and there is no oppression, and they're all free. I'm giving you my own perspective. And this is my perspective, and it's for you to assess it, and then decide where, where you want to do this. It's a methodology. It's a way of thinking. Uh, those of you who have taken to heart tonight, for example, even though it's a little bit of a little bit arrogant of me, but those who know me from the past know that you know this stuff, um, won't be able to think about the same issue again in the same way, and you will see that. And even if you cannot bring the evidence, your mind does not function exactly the same way. I'm not saying everyone. I'm saying those who fully understood the purpose of it. There are so many sources, by the way, in English that could achieve this. In fact, once I was invited to a seminar and they told me, we don't have any sources in, in English. And I said, you want sources? And they said, yes. And I said, okay, one promise. You make a point to purchase all the sources and make a library, which they didn't, by the way. And I compiled a 15-page bibliography on the issue of women and Islam alone. And this bibliography is in the Islamic Center of Southern California, what in I meant, English. What I meant was they're not readily available in any bookstore. I think it's more. Yeah, that's true. I think it's more than just readily available. I think even if it was available, even if people did say something, there's something that stops people from spreading this kind of knowledge, or there's something that stops the spread of this kind of knowledge. There's emphasis, I mean, for some reason, we choose to emphasize should nail polish be worn in a mosque or not, or whatever, <coughs> we, instead of like something that actually has an effect on life. There's some, there's some, it's not just a lack of knowledge, it's a matter of even if somebody feels like they have knowledge and they, they, they've got something, you can't just go forward from the community and then share that because, I mean, even tonight, I mean, as a lot of people, you you can't go to Saudi Arabia, have a bunch of women who've never driven and tell them, look how stupid this Dimbaz is, or whatever. No, <laughs> no, no. no one, even no even one tonight, can't do that. Most of what, most of what you hear tonight, you are not going to be able to share with other Muslims. That's a fact. Yeah, but to, what, there's something wrong about that fact, don't yeah. you think? Yeah. Yeah, what, what, I mean, there's got to be, but that barrier has to, I mean, it's I think one it hope that that can be overcome. Well, it can you, be overcome. You, you, we I have mean, to we have to overcome. You are, you are the youth, okay? 
finding the solutions is your job. I do my job by going and spending 15 hours sometimes a day pouring over medieval texts, dusty medieval texts, bringing them out and writing about them and lecturing about them, and that's my job. I cannot solve the problems of Muslim American youth because I myself, I am not a Muslim American youth. I grew up in Egypt and I do not understand your problems and I do not understand your tastes. What I understand is <coughs> that the type of Islam that I see practiced is very alien from the type of Islam that I know through these books. It is for you to sit down and brainstorm and think about why and how and when. I am, I liken myself to sort of a, the remains of a dinosaur. It lets you know that it existed. It lets you know the history and the past but it makes no material difference in the present. And that's exactly it. I'm but not talking about... But these fatwas are a clear indication that something is wrong all over the Islamic world, not just with us in the Muslim America. The West is not. So yes, what is exactly. Islam? Well, okay, let's see what the West is, and, and Islam we'll is the exactly, opposite. Exactly. So, in the words of Muhammad al-Ghazali, my teacher, one of my teachers, he says that Islam became a reaction, not an action, not an independent action. When I come and I basically, when I come and sit here, and allow you to set the terms of the discourse. For example, we start out by saying, okay, you know Khalid, we are going to talk, but I don't want you to say anything that violates the Quran or the Sunnah or the, or the practice of the Sahaba, okay? I am reacting to you. In other words, the terms of the discourse have already been set. An independent action is something that produces its own terms of discourse. For centuries, since basically the set of colonialism, I would say the 16th century was the last time there was a real assertion of Islamic identity. I mean, we've gone up and down. The idea that the Islamic civilization ended by the 4th century is nonsense. Uh, Islamic civilization remained very vibrant and very alive to the 16th century Christian and continued to the 17th century. The 18th, 19th, and 20th century is where the deterioration really starts. But the 19th and 20th century is where Islam basically becomes defined as a reaction to the other and simply as a reaction to the other. So what I am, I am not alarmed about that in these countries. Why? Because these countries have their own historical legacies that they're going to have to work out. Egypt is going to have to work out through its own historical legacy. Iran is going to work, has to work out through its own historical legacy. It's going, in these countries, they will go astray and they will come back, and it will go on forever. I mean, Egypt has been around for what, 6,000 years? and Iran, I don't know for how many thousand years, and they've gone up and gone down and all that. American Muslims are a different story. They could become extinct. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not a permanent thing. And time is not in their favor. Time is against them, not for them. In Egypt, I can afford to sit with a sheikh, and the sheikh says, patience, my son, patience, my son, it will all pass. And we just sit and we let and we go and watch the world go by and, you know, the generations will come, the generations will go and rulers come and rulers go and life has its... Here, it's a very different scenario. But what... but um, this reactionary Islam, something has 
it has given validity to it, or else it wouldn't have been allowed to continue. I mean... You do. Yeah, so people don't think. People are, are just don't have... I don't mean you personally. Yeah, no, I know. But you, you do. I mean, the, the youth... I mean, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I keep saying this everywhere. The youth who grow up in the United States repeat, re, understanding Islam, and this is what we'll get into tomorrow and after tomorrow, as a legalistic code and not a moral code, who fail to understand the morality and the value system behind Islam and look at it basically as a system of laws, haram and haram, not as a system of heart, Felt morality of right and wrong. These are the people who are re repeating the same mistakes, right. and that is why, by the legalistic code, and that is why, by the way, I tell you this. And and anyway, we'll get into this later. I mean, there is a selection by Mutahari about the difference between agnostics and jurists, and and agnostics are the Sufi. And and the the, the point that I am making is that Islam cannot be only morality and purity and heart and cannot be only laws. And Muhammad Akbar made this point in the 1930s in the reconstruction of religious thought, that this is not a religion of laws, and a religion of laws becomes a means of oppression. But if every youth who grows up under his parents and replicates, and I'll be very honest with you, replicates Egyptian culture, replicate, replicates Saudi culture, replicates Indo-Pakistani culture, replicates the, the biases, replicates the haters, the arguments, the Shia, the Sunnah, well, I, we, we don't marry from Arabs, well, we don't marry from Indo-Pakistanis, well, you know, the Pakistanis are never like, you know, the real protectors of Islam are the Arabs, and I hear this among the youth as well. And I hear it not as bluntly, but it's there. So, you did. I mean, it's simple as that. Now, wh what do you do about it? I mean, it's in, in your hands. I mean, I, I think Amila is, is a good idea, but you, um, every youth who basically accepts a position of passivity and I'll tell you, I mean, I've been doing this since 1982, exactly. And by 1991, I've started the making very few appearances with Muslims, and, and, uh, and I, I think that um, the problem with a lot of the youth is that they grow up. And that, that is really it. Is in 1981, 1982, and 1983, and 1984, and 1985, I've taught a lot of people. And throughout the years, I've watched youth move from the university of saying, oh my God, what's going on, to growing up, getting married, getting a job, being caught up in the mainstream, and then going, buying a house, and having a family, and all of that, and then Islam becoming a cultural refuge again not an ideological message. And then that use eventually develops a belly and the woman has a line of children following her everywhere and they, you know, they come and sit and they want to hear a good hadith and a good Quranic verse. And these are people that I've taught in 1982. I mean, and, and I'm not trying to tell you what's all lost. I'm just trying to tell you that this is something that you should watch out for. All of you should watch out for. And eventually, and go on. And frankly, I am sort of getting tired of it. The, the rate of return is so low that you have to start asking yourself, um, what's the point? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Well, the fact is that we're ordered to to um, the, the the fact is that we're we're ordered to work, and we don't look at the results. I mean, yeah. the, the the other way is that I do write and I do publish in English, and it's there. 
so it's there. I mean, it, it's not easy reading, and uh, it, it's the type of stuff that you sort of need hours to get through 30 pages. But it's there you know, for people who can exploit it whenever they want. Okay, is there any more questions?